In eighth grade, I took a class called civics. It's the first time I remember learning about representative democracy, the three independent branches of government, and our system of checks and balances. It's also when I first realized that democracy is not guaranteed, that it may not always be here for us. It was November 22nd, 1963, and our class was interrupted by an announcement over the PA system, and this is what the principal said. The president has been shot. President Kennedy has been shot and has died. I was numb. I sat still in that classroom wondering if the very democracy I had been studying would survive. I had similar feelings in high school when I watched the civil rights protests right here in my hometown. And in college when I participated in protests against the war in Vietnam. And in law school when I watched the Watergate proceedings and the impeachment of a president. Today, I wonder again if our democracy will survive. Representative democracy is supposed to work like this. Voters select people to represent them in making difficult government decisions that affect all of our lives. But that's not what's happening. And if we don't act to fix it, we could be studying representative democracy in history books and not in civics classrooms. Many Americans are giving up on democracy. They don't trust government any longer. In 1997, there was a poll. Respondents were asked, do you always or almost always trust your government? 39% said yes. In 2015, the same question was asked, and only 19% said yes. People think democracy is broken, that it's rigged. They point to big money in politics. They point to gridlock. They point to the bitter partisan divide. They're becoming disengaged, no longer participating. And if you need evidence of that, just look at this last presidential election in which less than half of the eligible voters in America went to the polls. Less than half of the eligible voters voted. Today, I would like to discuss with you what I believe is one of the root causes of this disengagement, distrust, and apathy towards government. Every 10 years after the census, we draw new election districts. We do this because in the interim period, population shifts. People move to one place, some places grow, some places lose population. And we redraw the districts so as to get, as close as possible, the same number of voters in each district. This is so each vote will count the same, will have the same meaning. United States Supreme Court, Baker versus Carr, one person, one vote. But that's not what's happening in America today. The system we use for redistricting in most states today is damaging democracy, diminishing the vote. We have a system where politicians are drawing districts for their own partisan advantage. We have a system where politicians are picking their voters instead of voters picking their politicians. Let me say that again. 
We have a system where politicians are picking their voters instead of voters picking their politicians. How is this happening? Well, it's happening because of something we call gerrymandering. It's a group of techniques that can lead to some of the problems that we've talked about. Gerrymandering is defined as the dividing of a state, county, or other political subdivision into election districts so as to give one political party a majority in as many districts as possible while concentrating the voting strength of the other party in as few districts as possible. Where did we get the name gerrymandering? Well, there was a governor of Massachusetts once, Elbridge Gerry. And he signed into law a redistricting plan that virtually everyone thought was unfair to the opposing party. And the press put a depiction of that plan in the newspaper. And they said, you know, that district looks like a salamander. And so they called it gerrymandering. And just so you don't think we've gotten rid of all the political salamanders, this is a district drawn in North Carolina in 1992 by Democrats. This is a district drawn in 2012 in North Carolina by Republicans. So how does gerrymandering work? Well, there are really two key pieces of gerrymandering. Packing and cracking. So you pack sometimes as many voters that are similar. You look at their voting history. You pack them all into a district, conceding that they will well win that district. But you diminish their impact on all the other districts. Or you find a group of similar voters and you crack them. You spread them out into a number of different, different districts. Again, with the goal of diminishing their vote. Gerrymandering. So, why do politicians use these techniques? They do so to create as many safe districts as they can. Because they want partisan advantage. A safe district is one where your party will win the general election. It's virtually guaranteed. You pick your party nominee in the primary, and then they're virtually guaranteed of election. Let me give you an example. In 2016, in the congressional elections in North Carolina, North Carolina, by the way, has 13 congressional seats. If you added up all the votes cast for Congress in the entire state, 53% of the vote went to a Republican candidate, and 47% went to a Democrat candidate. Now, if you apply those percentages, 53% and 47%, to 13, your math's better than mine, but it comes out 7 to 6. 7 Republican. Six, Democrat. Well, what was the outcome of the election? Ten Republicans, three Democrats. Every single candidate who won their election, whether Democrat or Republican, had at least 56% of the vote. All but two, that is 11 of the candidates, had 58%, and a majority had over 60% of the vote. Those are huge margins in an election. It was gerrymandered. The election was gerrymandered. So what does that mean for us? Well, if you're a candidate running for office in a safe district, you only need to appeal to the voters in your party, in your, in your safe district. You don't need to worry about the voters in the other party or the independents because if you win the primary, 
you're going to get elected in the general election. And if you get elected and you're an incumbent, what are you worried about? You're worried about not the general election, but somebody attacking you from further in the extreme of your party. We now have a word for that called primaried. You can get primaried. Those candidates that run in those safe districts really don't have a reason to be accountable once elected to many of the voters. And the voters in those safe districts increasingly feel like they're disenfranchised, that their vote doesn't matter anymore because it's already fixed, it's rigged ahead of time. And the more people that feel that way, the more at risk our democracy is. Because if, if we, the people, we, the people, lose confidence in our form of government, it will collapse. So who do we blame for gerrymandering? Well, I think you ought to blame the Republicans. And I think you ought to blame the Democrats. Remember those salamanders, Democrats 1992, Republicans 2012, both parties using computers have become very, very good at this game of gerrymandering. Both parties are guilty. I spent 17 years as a judge. I know guilty when I see it. <laughs> and they're both guilty. So the question then is, what can be done? Is there a solution? If we draw districts not considering partisan politics, we don't take into account voter history. We don't take into account party registration. The result is more competitive districts. And with more competitive districts, the candidates have to appeal to all the voters. They have to listen to the concerns that we all have if they want to get elected. And when they get elected, they're accountable for accomplishing something. So they have to think about how to work across the aisle with people in a different party in order to make something happen if they want to get reelected. It changes the dynamics of government. And it can be done. Let me, let me share an example of how I think it can be done. So this is a map drawn in 2011 by the North Carolina General Assembly for congressional districts. You might see a few salamanders in there. The results of this map used in 2012 election and 2014 election was nine Republicans elected, four Democrats in 2012, 10 Republicans, three Democrats in 2014. And the, this map was challenged in the courts, and the courts threw it out. So the legislature drew a new map. Still got some live animals in it. And the result of this map in 2016 was, again, 10 Republicans, 3 Democrats. Well, as part of my work at Duke University, I brought together... Ten retired judges, five of whom had run for office as Democrats, five of whom had run for office as Republicans. And by the way, five of them were former chief justices of the North Carolina Supreme Court. And I asked them to act as if they were a bipartisan independent commission to draw congressional districts for North Carolina. The catch was they couldn't consider partisan politics. They couldn't look at voting history. They couldn't look at party registration. They had to worry about, first of all, one person, one vote, getting the population right. But they also had to worry about trying to keep communities together, make compact districts. This is what the judges drew. 
After they finished, we did a political analysis of this, looking at voting history, to see what the outcome would likely be in a congressional election run with this map. It came out this way. Six seats leaned Republican. Four seats leaned Democrat. Three seats were toss-ups. Completely different in terms of competitiveness. So, to me, the answer is we have to demand a new way of doing business in terms of drawing districts. This is true for congressional districts, legislative districts, city council districts. And the key is to do it on a nonpartisan basis, which really simply means don't consider party registration, don't consider voting history. If you follow this path, you end up with more competitive districts. You end up with voters' voices being heard again. You end up with elected officials that have to be accountable to voters, have to look for solutions to problems. You end up with a democracy like the one our founders intended for us to enjoy. If you're a Democrat or a Republican or a member of another party or an independent, you have something at stake here. In the past, your party may have gained or lost as a result of gerrymandering. But the big loser has been democracy. That's the loser here, is democracy. And it's our responsibility, together, to demand a solution. It's our responsibility to do what is necessary so that our democracy can thrive. And so we don't have to worry about whether it will survive. If you live in a state that allows citizen referendums, get on board. If you live in a state like North Carolina that requires legislative action, you need to step up and let your legislators know that the madness has to end. We need nonpartisan redistricting just as much as we need democracy. The next redistricting happens soon. The time is now. Thank you.